Well, good morning. I do want to say happy Father's Day to all the dads, sometimes the moms who act like dads, the stunt dads who didn't have their own kids but love on other people's kids. It's a wonderful thing to be here. But one of the things I know just from that video is some of you grew up with dads who never did say that you're loved, you're accepted, they're proud of you. And so you struggle today with who God is because of who your dad was. And so I want you to know there's some great examples around here. Rodney's one of the great examples we have here at our church. We have lots of wonderful examples of godly men, imperfect men. Trust me on that one. Uh, but, uh, but God is our perfect father. And on a day like this, no matter what you celebrate, I hope you'll remember what he's done for you. Today we're going to talk about the pursuit of of righteousness, and we're going uh, to do three chapters in Romans. And the reason why is these three chapters go together. Um, if I was doing a seminary class, each of these chapters would be a four-hour lesson. So we're getting a quick flyover, uh, and sometimes that's just, that's just what we do. And so uh, I would encourage you to go back and read these three vital chapters in Scripture. John 17, 17, Jesus prayed for the early church, and he said this, Sanctify them by the truth, and then he says, your word is truth. So Jesus is praying for us, and he says, Lord, use your word, use the Bible, use the scripture you've given us in order to help people to be sanctified. But here's what I know. <coughs> we tend to do one of two things. We either, way over here, we, we try to live the Christian life, we try to live it in our own power and our own strength, and, and we fail and we falter and we are hard on ourselves and we condemn ourselves, and then we, we just kind of stay in this dungeon of pursuing through our flesh righteousness or goodness or sanctification. The other extreme is this, we, we tried to be righteous and then we finally just said, you know what? I'm just not even going to worry about it anymore. I'm just going to be Popeye. You know what Popeye used to say? I am what I am. You know? I just am who I am. There's no need to change. If you don't make time and if you don't focus your life understanding that God has called you, Jesus has called you as a Christian, that's where we got this name, to be like Christ. The early Christians were called Christians as an insult. They said, you act like Jesus, and yet so many of us could never be accused of actually being a Christian. My hope is that no matter where you're at on your journey, you'd recognize the importance. Let me, let me just give you an example. So we went hiking when we were in North Carolina. We hiked a, uh, uh, one of the hikes we took was a place called Triple Falls, and it, of course, started raining. We were on the way up there, so we're hiking, and, and I have a goal for hikes. That is, the beauty at the end of the hike must be greater than the difficulty of the hike. And so if I look up a hike and it says a really hard hike and the view is okay, I go, nay, nay, not a hike for me, right? So I like easy hikes with great views. Driving to the great view is even better, but you don't always get that option. So we went to Triple Falls. We go up there. We go out. It starts raining. So the kids kind of went out, saw Triple Falls, and they took off. We took a couple pictures, and they were gone. We got home, and I recognized or was looking up something, and I saw that one of my kids' favorite movies was, part of it was filmed at Triple Falls. So I waited, we were in the living room, and I found that movie, and I fast-forwarded to the middle, and I said, you gotta see this, and I pushed play. And my daughter looked at the movie as it's playing and goes, we were right there! I stood right where his face is, which was a hilarious comment. And if she had known when she was there, she would have paid more attention. I believe some of us are going to get to heaven. And one of our first things is going to be if I had recognized how important the moments God has given me were, uh, were each moment, I would have paid more attention attention. See, some of you have lost your joy because you quit even trying to pursue holiness and righteousness. You just got tired of it. Maybe at one point you really pursued knowing and loving God, but you've gotten busy. But I don't want you to think of that in the wrong way. So I'm going to give you two or three things today to help you recognize that the real goal, listen, the real goal is not a list to be good. Okay. The real goal is not that you make a list and go, this is, these are the things I need to do. The real goal is, listen, if you keep your eyes on Jesus 
it becomes natural to do the things he's called you to do. And when you take your eyes off Jesus, it's very easy to pursue the wrong thing. So today, our, what we're going to talk about is truths about pursuing righteousness. So here's the first thing I want you to know. We're going to go to chapter 6 of Romans. And like I said, you could read the whole thing later. Paul says this in verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Some people were, were basically saying to Paul, Hey, listen, since we don't have to obey the law, let's just do whatever we want and not worry about it because God's grace is so good. And Paul's like, uh, should we do that? And then he says, by no means, which almost sounds British to me. I almost hear Paul going, by no means. We are those who've died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And this is the symbolism of baptism. When you see somebody at our church gets baptized, get baptized, what's the symbolism? And Jesus did it as an example to us, not because he was sinful, but just as an example to us to follow. He went into the river and John did what? Baptized him, dying to yourself. And living for Christ. That's what it represents. And so Paul alludes to that idea and saying not only is that an outward thing that we've done. But it's also an inward thing that we need to continue to do. Why? Because you're given holiness and righteousness from God. But you still have to pursue righteousness. God sees you as righteous. But it doesn't mean your old habits aren't hanging on. I'll get there in a second. For if we've been united with him in his death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Do you recognize that you're dead to sin? And so when you sin, if you're a believer... When you sin, you should have some conscience about it. If you can sin and pursue sin, 1 John is very clear. If you can walk in darkness, you have no conviction. You just do whatever you want to do. You may not be a Christian. Because if you're able to do whatever you want to do and pursue a life of sin, have you ever really surrendered your will to His? I had a poodle named Squire, Squire loved Kentucky Fried Chicken. And we threw Kentucky Fried Chicken in the trash. And Squire was fine. And then I left the house. <clears throat> and I drove down the street and realized, oh no, I forgot my wallet. I had not been gone one minute. I drove back to the house, opened the door. There the trash can was down. Squire is holding a bone in his mouth, looking at me. And I think what he's thinking is... If I don't move, he won't see me. So I walked towards Squire and he literally... I chased Squire all around the house. Could not catch him. I finally got his more favorite treat, which was cheese. And I traded him cheese for the bone. And I'll be honest, he was so quick that he almost got the bone back before I got the cheese to him. He almost had a twofer. Many of us are that way when it comes to sin. We come to church and we say, yes, I want to, I desire righteousness. I can keep my focus on Christ. But as soon as we leave the building, oh, that chicken looks good. And if we're not careful, we'll allow those old habits to rule us and we'll run after things. By the way, you guys know chicken bones aren't good for dogs, right? But nobody told the dog. There are habits that you and I do that we know are not good for us. And yet those old habits hang on. Let me ask you this. Are you living the new life that this chapter, chapter 6, talks about? Are you experiencing love and joy and peace? See, if you don't pursue righteousness, the other thing you won't see is miracles. And if you ever saw them, you wouldn't recognize them. Why? Because you're blind. Why? Because you're chasing the wrong things. When your head's in the garbage, it's hard to see Jesus. Number two, we struggle with sin habits. Now, i got a question for you. How many of you are one hand... Okay, let's start with this one. How many of you have never sent a text 
You've never texted anybody. Impressive. You're either lying or everyone sent a text. Okay. How many of you in here are one finger texters? You text using one hand, one hand. Use one hand. Okay, lots of one hand. How many of you are two-handed texters? Right? Now, if you all of a sudden went from trying to text with one hand to texting with two hands, it would be a big change for you. Now, I don't know if you've ever done the exercise where you tried to write with your off hand. How many of you ever tried to write with the wrong hand? Isn't that fun? For many of us, when we become Christians, the Bible says he's given us a brand new nature. But we're used to writing and doing the way we've always done. Those old habits hang in there. See if you can relate to what Paul's saying. Now recognize that Paul, <laughs> Paul's like, the, the discipline that Paul had is like a thousand times what we have. And yet listen to what he says here. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I don't understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate to do, and if I do what I do not want to do, I agree the law is good, as it is. It is no longer I myself who do it, but the sin living in me, for I know that good itself doesn't dwell in me, in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what's good, but I can't carry it out. For I don't do the good I want to do, but the evil I want to do, I keep on doing. Do not want to do, I keep on doing. Time out. This is what that looks like for you. You have a friend or a relative that's difficult. And every time you get around them, you get aggravated. And maybe you even say a few things that you shouldn't say. So on the way to see them, you have a little pep talk with yourself, right? <clears throat> and the pep talk goes like this. You are not going to let them fluster you. You are not going to get upset. You are going to be kind. And when they say something rude, you're going to be sweet to them. And then the moment comes. And they say or do what they always say or do. And without meaning to and before you know it, you go. Wah, 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 and immediately you think, I said I wasn't going to do that. But I just did that. Has anybody in here had that experience? Now, if you've been on a diet, it's the same thing. I'm telling you, if I went on a, a, a Girl Scout cookie diet tomorrow, Girl Scouts would show up at my door with a barrel of cookies and say, we're giving these away today. See, the enemy knows the chicken that's in your garbage can. He knows what tempts you. And so he's going to try to provide that all the times he can, but it's up to you to recognize it and to at least, like Paul, feel conviction about the areas of your life where you've pursued the wrong thing. Paul continues. So I find this law at work, although I want to do good, evil's right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And I love this sentence. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself, in my mind, am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. See, dogs are a great example to us of what we do in our sin habits. I had to give Buster his flea and heartworm medicine yesterday. Buster does not like to take flea or heartworm medicine. Now, we have another dog named Montana, sweetest dog in the world. I literally can go like this and say, Montana, take your medicine. Montana comes over, takes her medicine, eats it, walks off and says, I'm a good girl. Buster, however, so somebody said, well, have you tried peanut butter? So I coat it in peanut butter, and I put it down here, and Buster goes, nope. He goes and hides, because he knows what's next. If he won't get it, I'm going to grab him and shove it down his throat. This is good for you! Right? It's a wonderful opportunity. So yesterday I decided, we're not going to play choke the dog today. I'm going to trick him with his sin nature. 
So he knows he's not supposed to get on the table and get food. But sometimes it's just too delicious when my kids leave a taco on the table. So yesterday what I did, I took a plate and I took his two medicines. I put peanut butter on them. I put a piece of bread under one of them and poured some chicken broth on there. I made a little sign that said, Busters, do not eat for my children who might grab something off the table and throw it in their mouths. I figured they did not need flea and tick prevention. And I took the plate and I sat down at my computer working on the sermon and I pretended that I was eating off. Now, this is sad, isn't it? I pretended I was eating off the plate. The plate's right on the edge of the table. And Buster's just watching me. So I go into the kitchen, pretend I'm not looking. Buster jumps up on the table, grabs both those pills, swallows them, and I'm like, victory is mine! Until my wife got home and said, are you teaching him to get on the table? I'm like, no, that wasn't the... See, he thought it was forbidden fruit, so it looked more appetizing. Hey, hey. Your old habits, those old sins look appetizing. But as soon as you bite into them, the enemy will go from saying this is no big deal to I can't believe you did that. What a wretched man I am. Just like Paul says, but then he says, but thanks be to God, he's delivering me. He's delivering me. Now, one of the things I would encourage you to do every day is to spend time Allowing the Holy Spirit to evaluate your heart. Are there any sinful ways in me? Are there, is there any place where I'm not keeping my eye on God? One of the things I remember Peter Lord telling the story about training. Uh, uh, he had one of those, uh, uh, some type of hound dog. And he was training it and he would take its bone and he would throw it and he'd say fetch. And the dog would fetch the bone, bring it back to him and hand it to him. And then he was teaching the dog to stay. So he would say, stay. And he took the bone and he threw the bone over the dog. And the dog tried to turn. He said, nope, stay. And the dog came back and watched Peter. And he said he was watching him for a minute. And then all of a sudden, his rear end started sliding out. And then he would turn away and get the bone. When you focus on sin... When you focus on that thing that you know shouldn't be your focus, it's easy to fall into it. But if you will focus on your master, if you'll focus on Christ, if you'll spend time in God's word, if you will confess those desires that are wrong, if you'll confess those sins that you ran after, if you'll give the chicken bone back to the father, then he'll begin to change your heart. Praise be To God. Number three, we are called to be conformed. Do you know what this is? I'll give you a hint. (coughs) Right? So if you have asthma and you get where you can't, I made somebody cough, sorry. Uh, If you have asthma and you want to borrow this, uh, if you get asthma and you get where you can't breathe, right, this helps you to breathe better. In the Bible, the Holy Spirit, the word for Holy Spirit is the word for wind or, listen to this, breath. Too often, we're so busy pursuing the world that we've not stopped and said, Holy, if my kids keep texting me, Happy Father's Day, I'm going to say, leave me alone. Uh, uh, but we get so busy doing whatever that, that we don't allow the Holy Spirit to fill us. And then we wonder why we're tired. We wonder why we don't have the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. There's times that you should sit and say, Holy Spirit... Would you convict me of sin, but also of righteousness? Some of your worst sin for some of you is that you look in the mirror and you talk to yourself about how unworthy you are. When the enemy comes to me sometimes, and this happens, says, who do you think you are? I say, a child of God. Forgiven. But you mess up. I do. But that's why when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. The enemy will do the same thing to you. Some of you grew up in a home where maybe your dad called you foolish or even stupid or worse. And you still struggle with that today. That is not God, your father, telling you that. Listen to what Paul says next. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about, listen, 
your adoption as to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Time out. i got to talk to you about this for a second. Listen. Abba literally means daddy. It is a very informal and loving way to reach out. And what Paul is saying in this verse is, God is not just your father. Father, I need your help. Could you please provide for me, father? No, it's daddy. And daddy's the one who says, let the children come to me. You're adopted as children. You have all the rights of Jesus. That's awesome to think that you're seated with Jesus. How did, where did I get that from? Well, keep reading. Keep reading. Now, if we're children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in the sufferings in order that we may also, listen, share in his glory. A few verses later, many people's favorite verse. And we know that in all things, God works for the good. Time out. Don't hear this wrong. It doesn't say that everything that happens to you is good. We live in a sinful world where sinful people are allowed to sin and hurt you. But God can use that hurt for good. Some of you were hurt as kids. God's not saying, that was a wonderful thing that happened to you. No, no. But he's saying, hey, I know that happened to you, and I can use that for the good. If, listen, who've been called according to his purpose, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So he's saying, you're going to be more like Jesus, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. See, I don't think, if, you've been a, if you're 80 years old and you've been a Christian since you were 20, I don't think you should look like you did when you were 20. And the difficulty is, life, if you don't surrender daily to the Lord, life will make you harder, will make you more bitter, will make you more frustrated. But the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes to live in you, what happens? He helps you to become more loving, more caring. I remember years ago, there was a man named Bob, he was in his 80s. And he became a Christian in his 80s. I said, I bet you your parents kept claiming that verse. When they're old, they won't depart from it. I've been praying for you to get old a long time. In his 80s, he came to Christ. And then he came to me and he said, you know, one of the things I regret is I was a terrible dad. He said, I, my daughter won't even talk to me. He said, I, I, I would love to be able to talk to her. I said, well, two things. Number one, begin praying about it. But number two, why don't you write her a note? Or give her a call and just apologize. I said, now, she doesn't have to forgive you. She doesn't have to reunite with you. But that's between you and her. But you need to do what God calls you to do. So I didn't know what would happen. I, I thought the next conversation we would have would be, my daughter hung up the phone on me. But instead, the next time I, I saw him, he said, my daughter's coming to Thanksgiving dinner. Week after week, month after month, he would tell me, my daughter and I have reunited. She forgave me, and we now have a relationship. If you could have seen Bob that first day, I met him with the bitterness and the heartache and the frustration and the anger that he carried everywhere he went, you would know there's a God because Bob went from being angry, frustrated, cynical, to loving, kind, caring, and his daughter saw it. Although we struggle with sin, although we struggle with old habits, God has given us the Holy Spirit to come inside of us, to convict us of sin, but then also to change us. So that people that you used to not care a whole lot about, you love. And people you disagree with, you love. And people who don't believe the same as you, you still love. You're more concerned about the kingdom of God than you are about your own kingdom. And it changes you and softens your heart. May that be true of all of us. My prayer is that all of us would keep our eyes on Jesus every day. That we'd spend time in his word refocusing, singing songs of praise to refocus so that we don't pursue sin. And when we do, we drop it and give it back to him. But we pursue him and his kingdom in our lives. 
you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, that's the first step to pursuing His kingdom is to surrender to Him. Maybe you're here today and as a Christian, the truth is, the world has gotten you bitter. You got tired of pursuing God. And maybe today that is the day that you say, God, you know what? I've not pursued righteousness. I've not pursued the sanctification you have for me here. But I want to, from this point on, look and keep my eyes on you every day. Lord, I surrender all to you. And maybe that's what you need to do today. Let's close in prayer today. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for so many good dads, but I know beyond all of our imperfect dads that you are the perfect father. Lord, I pray today that we might surrender to you, but also focus on you. Lord, the world will try to distract us with all kinds of things, but I pray instead our focus, our minds, our hearts will be turned for you. Fill us with your spirit. We can't live the Christian life on our own. We can't be good on our own. It's only through your spirit that we can become more like Christ. So fill us with your spirit today. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.